you know what time it is. It's time to put some balance back into your life. My name is Ian O'Neill. I'm joined by Harry Powell today. And we have no UFC fights this weekend to break down or no general fights in mixed martial arts to break down for uh, the last weekend, the weekend gone by, which is quite unusual. Normally, there's something on. But we had a weekend off, Harry. I guess before we get into everything else, we're probably going to take a look at, you know, the guys, Shawnee and uh, Spencer, had a state of the UFC address this week on the big podcast. We're going to have a a bit of a state of mixed martial arts podcast today and talk about a little bit of this, a little bit of that from all the various promotions, maybe outside the UFC. And I'm going to hand it over to Harry Pal. How was your weekend? How was your MMA free weekend? I know I got a shit ton of stuff done. I was saying to you before, um, we kind of get these little breaks every now and again, a little bit of lull in action and it's, it's all gearing up. Like I mean, we're coming to the end of the the spring break now, if you want to call it, and we're coming into the summer schedule. It's going to be helter skelter, and uh, yeah, we're going to be in with a couple of UFCs in over the course of the next I don't know nine ten weeks, I guess, um, where we don't get a break. But it's always nice to get that break, Harry. Whenever we do get it, isn't it? I agree. I mean, there's um, they say that that distance makes the heart grow fonder, and I think certainly for MMA. It certainly does that. There's there's um, there's a real rigmarole to to following MMA to covering MMA, um, even as a fan, just as a straight fan. I think there's a there's a ton of effort that people go to, especially on this side of the world in in the UK and Europe. Long nights, you know, you're well aware of them. You'll remember them. Long nights, early mornings. You know, it sort of takes out your your entire weekend to to watch one of the UFC events or even a Bellator or a PFL or whatever it is you're watching. And so there's uh when you get a weekend off, you kind of remember what it's like to be a rational human and and not one of the scumbags like you and I that that, that follow fights for for semi living. But I um look, I think there's this is probably going to be like a slightly impromptu speaker's corner. And I apologize, Shawnee, on behalf of, uh, uh, you should have been here. You're not here. I apologize next time, whatever. But Ian O'Neill deserves one of these as well. Right. So, so we'll go, but, but I, I, I think when I was listening to the start of the state of the UFC address, this, this week's big podcast was there is such a hyper focus as always. And as there will be, and, and forever there will be this is there's a hyper focus towards the UFC. They are the premier organization have been for a long, long, long time, but something that Shawnee and I have spoken about on, on recent speakers corners is that I'm not sure that they're going to be that forever. Potentially that there has been a slip. If you will, there has been, um, some, movement, some uh, space, a gap that's been filled marginally by other promotions. And and I think that for the most part, that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing for MMA. It's a good thing for competition of MMA promotions. It's a good thing for fighters. But I I feel like there's a conversation to be had, and, and we're about to have it, about the landscape of MMA. And we can look at this from a multitude of different angles, right? We can look at it from uh, the the skill of a fighter. You know, there was a conversation on Twitter recently about who was the most violent and who was the least violent fighter in UFC history. And I'd like to get, I'll, I'll ask that question and let's talk about that at the end of this, right? That's, I, I'll get your thoughts at the very, very end and it'll give us time to think as we go through the podcast. But, but what that made me think of is, well, okay, well, that encapsulates everyone in the UFC, everyone in UFC history ever. Okay, well then let's consider, I went all the way back to UFC 1 to try to answer that question. And as I then thought about UFC 1, I'm like, Jesus, if we went back and watched a fighter from UFC 1, and we then look up, we we might have a conversation about uh, UFC 290 coming up. If you put any fighter from UFC 1 to 5 in with any fighter from UFC 290, it's a bloodbath. It's an absolute bloodbath. So we can look at where is MMA today or what's the what's the breakdown of, of MMA full stop in 2023. We can look at it from a skills perspective. We can look at it from a promotional perspective. We can look at it from sort of a, a character perspective. But for me, I feel like it's interesting to say what's the state of MMA full stop. My opinion is just broadly going over those topics from a skill perspective. It's never been better. I think from a competition perspective, from from a promotional standpoint, it's never been better either. I think more competition is always better. From a character perspective, I actually think it's never been worse. Um, 
and maybe we can dive into each of those. Can you give me your thoughts briefly on on the first one? What 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 is it from a skill perspective right now, in your opinion? Well, it's huge unless you're you're looking at um, what was his name's Gracie guy's performance from a couple of weeks. That was a, a bit. It kind of made made me flashback. Who was it? Uh, it was um, Cron. Cron, Cron Gracie? Yeah, um, yeah. Just watching his performance um, thrown into a pay per view card mixed with very very highly skilled and look at Cron Gracie is highly skilled as well he just chose to use just Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu rather silly enough in that fight with Charles Jordan but I think when we go in and we actually see that and it's right in front of our face we can kind of realize Harry that you know MMA and the skill progression in mixed martial arts has kind of progressed very very well over the last 30 years like given you know uh ufc and, and and mixed martial arts is 30 year and the anniversary is this year as well so um it's it's very strange and you know you kind of have to really think hard about what you're watching as you're watching it as well obviously we didn't catch it from the very very start and some people have and you know when you're kind of engrossed into it and watching fights every week i think now more than ever it's 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 harder to appreciate new skills coming into mixed martial arts where you know we have had a sport where it was fairly one-dimensional and based off one of your specialty skills as a mixed martial artist where now we're actually seeing the composition of multiple martial arts into a mixed martial arts fighter itself and and guys who are starting uh, into mixed martial arts training solely mixed martial arts and not training one like boxing or muay thai or wrestling on its own so um i think the progression has come leaps and bounds and i think it's still going to grow like at 30 years old man we've got a, a long way to go um with different techniques and different styles and molding them into kind of fit towards uh, mixed martial arts as an art itself but um, I think now more than ever, Harry, I don't know whether you can agree uh, or not. I think it's harder to kind of notice these things. And there was one fight in particular that you keep bringing up and and, and rightly so as well. And that is, that's Islam Mahachev and Alex Volkanovsky as that might be the point where we see multiple things kind of initiated into future uh, fighters game plans. Like, I mean, back in the day we had the jab, which caused fighters uh, fits in there a simple jab but when people nailed it down it caused problems gsp absolutely uh murdered josh kostjak with the with the uh, with the jab back in the day broke his eye socket etc we we're all raving about the jab bj penn had a fantastic jab as well you know something simple like that um more recently uh we've had the calf kick you know the calf kick which has been initiated in and obviously we've seen benson henderson throw it way back in the day but now we see the calf kick coming in where it's having a pivotal effect in almost every every fight that we see you know it's rare we don't see a calf kick in a fight uh these days but you know pinpointing the dominant kind of fight style at the minute which is your russian dagestani heavy wrestler kind of uh well-rounded uh on the feet but obviously dominant in the grappling department what we've seen in alex volkanovsky was was ways to counter that style as well which i feel is going to be initiated in the growth of mixed martial arts as a overall skill down the line um yeah so kind of went off there i'll throw it over to you maybe for your thoughts go off on as many fucking tangents as you want i love it um i agree i think if if we could probably pinpoint a number of different improvements and a number of different uh, evolutions, if you will, from the fight game. One is the jab. I think before then, it's just being able to switch stances, right? As rudimentary as that sounds now, as rudimentary as it is to think that a fighter could fight orthodox and southpaw, it, now when you say that it's like what do, what do you mean like fighters are switching stances they're they're switch hitting what i like to call switch hitting dustin poirier fantastic example of that max holloway fantastic example of that but you have fighters who are able to do what others thought were massive breakthroughs in the meta of fighting and i think that that's something that i really adore about mixed martial arts um probably by the time this comes out there'll be my interview with, with Sam Creasy that's out. And we sort of talked about 
MMA and its evolution. Sam has been through multiple eras of UK and European MMA. And I sort of asked him his opinion on what he thinks the sport has changed, how's it grown, how he continues to evolve. And sort of his his answer was just put himself in there with as many bodies and as many different styles as physically possible. But he also could argue that there have been vast swaths. I think there was your traditional wrestle boxer. And what I mean by that is an American, American style double leg, lower your level, penetrate the hips, rise, either drive them to the cage, take them down, or just take them down in open space. You then yeah. had a, the jab. We've talked about switch hitting. I think there are uh, the integration, the beginning integrations of wrestling and, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. There was then the low calf kick. There was then the idea of, of hiding kicks. There was the influx of Muay Thai and everything that that brings, the clinch game, the elbows, the kicks, whatever. Then there was a sort of a, 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 a more of an adoption of Greco style wrestling and everything that that introduces. And then I think, then we started to see the Dagestani influence. We started to see sort of the Georgian kickboxing. We saw the Dutch kickboxing influence come in way before that. But the Georgian uh, influx of kickboxing where there's a much more fluid striking ability to mix with with grappling. There was then some of the boxing elements from America and wherever, wherever, wherever. But now the big leap that we managed to see in Islam Makarshev versus Alexander Volkanovsky was the ability to use non-nationalistic it, I, to me it's the first fight where we truly saw a mixed martial arts fight yeah because it was a blending of everything yeah that's the thing and that's the key i was trying to get to as well is that what we've seen over the past maybe 30 years or so is like we've seen dominant styles uh kind of win out look at hoist with the brazilian jiu-jitsu way back in the day and then your wrestlers who had success and we got to a stage where fighters were good at everything at a stage. You know, they were they were good at their boxing, you're good at wrestling, you're good at jiu-jitsu, you're good at Muay Thai, you're good at all the judo, you're, whatever you want to put under that umbrella. But like you said, and I'll let you go on in just a minute, right now what we're like, it's already started, but it's going to progress now even further where we're seeing fighters who are molding all of these martial arts together to suit mixed martial arts, um, where we see the amalgamation of Brazilian jiu-jitsu and wrestling and boxing and, and and the calf kick and distance control and where you have your guard and everything like that, where, you know, that's going to be the next step. And we there is a couple of examples that we can already say, and, and the excellent one is the most recent one, and that's Islam and, and Alex Volkanovsky. So I'll let you continue. I think there's a really important delineation just to make here. And that's that I don't think anymore. You and I have had a conversation on Patreon um, and we talked about AI, right? We talked about what we thought the future of AI was going to be. How would it amalgamate with humans? Would it become its own species? All these sorts of things. I feel like what we're witnessing in front of us is the death of traditional martial arts. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I don't mean that as a throwaway comment either. What I mean, and what I think is one of the most beautiful things about MMA, is MMA in its purest form is a proving ground for technical proficiency. Because in MMA, especially at the highest levels, you will determine what works and what doesn't work. Now, in the UFC, or at least the unified rules that happens in America and, and Europe, uh, we aren't able to see a full plethora, a full arsenal of those techniques. We can't have um, knees to the, the head of a grounded opponent. We can't have uh, soccer kicks. We can't have stomps. We can't have these sorts of things. You can't have you know knees or, 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 or kicks to a grounded opponent, however you determine grounded opponent, whatever. And I think there's an argument to, to change that. Um, but for me, the, the thing that I don't think is happening anymore is I don't think at grassroots MMA, people are molding martial arts together. I just don't think they are. I think what's happening now, and Sam Creasy spoke on this a little bit in the interview, is he's like, I'm never going to show certain kicks that I learn in Taekwondo because they just don't work. They just don't exist. In, in mixed martial arts, because if somebody throws one of those kicks at me, I'm going to double leg them immediately. And then it's really bad times for them. 
Or if they throw this sort of punch from this sort of angle, I'm going to time them and I'm going to be able to kick them or I'm going to be able to do this or I'm going to be able to do that. And it's just not going to be good for them. And so I think that the the evolution of fighting is mixed martial arts. And I mean that as powerfully as it sounds. Mixed martial arts is like a black hole for traditional martial arts. It swallowed them. Regular, traditional martial arts. Yes, they have their place in certain aspects. When it comes to fighting, there is one martial art now, and it's MMA. And there's no two ways about it. Tony Bellew did an interview. Tony Bellew, famous uh, Liverpoolian boxer. Mm. And he was talking about the Tyson Fury, John Jones thing. And he referenced a time when one of his friends who uh, is a, was a UFC fighter, veteran UFC fighter, Tony had said, oh, like, let me see about this, this wrestling, this Brazilian jiu-jitsu thing. Because Tony held the opinion at one point that he'd be able to catch a lad coming in with an uppercut as he dove on a takedown or whatever it is. And he said they did one round and the guy landed two calf kicks, double legged him and finished him with a rear naked choke inside 40 seconds. And he said, there is absolutely no chance on earth that Tyson Fury does anything to John Jones. There's 100%. just no way. And he's right, because boxing is a beautiful art, a beautiful sport, a gorgeous display of human athleticism, of human cognition, but it's not fighting. Fighting is mixed martial arts because it is the most limitless, outside of left way, the most limitless fighting sport, fighting art, fighting rule set that you can find. And so when we look at fights like Islam Makhachev versus Alexander Volkanovsky, we're not watching a wrestler versus a striker. We're watching two mixed martial artists deploy an entire arsenal of mixed martial arts from exactly what you've said. Stance switching, striking, angles, range management, scrambles, straight wrestling, straight jiu-jitsu. Just, just gorgeous mixed martial arts, full stop. Yeah, and it's look at it's tough times with some stories that are coming out with mixed martial arts right now, but it's the pure the pure fighting that's keeping me into it now, analyzing fights, thinking about how fights are going to go. And it always kind of has been that for me as well. And for most fans, that's what it's about. When you have to look a little bit closer at the sport, it yeah, you know, there is some bad news stories out there. There are some stories that's not going to make you feel good. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I live and die for the guys who are getting into side the cage, no matter where they're at, um, UFC, Bellator, One Championship, PFL. And, you know, that's what it's all about, too. And I think, you know, in those tough times, that's what I think about. But let's take a look at the broader sphere. We've talk, talked a little bit about the skill uh, advancement. MMA as a whole right now, um, in general, I think, is in a pretty good place when when it comes to competition and promotions and options for fighters, um, it's been the best position that it's been in quite some time. I think I might go back to the days where we had like the strike forces, elite XCs, uh, flictions, um, maybe your prides and stuff like that. But you know, all those were swept up by the UFC back in the day. Um, now we're back at a place where we have like one championships and rising, maybe not as prominent as one championships. We have Bellator, we have PFL, and we have a couple of the, uh, the under regional shows like cage warriors, ECFC, LFA, all of those ones kind of in the U S and in Canada, we have KSW as well. And, and Octagon and Aries, lots and lots of different options for fighters as well. And it's a really healthy space to be in. And it's a kind of a, a good problem to have too, where you like having options and having other successful promotions is always a good thing. And, you know, the UFC will try and lead guy, uh, people to believe that, you know, that's not a good thing, but it is a good thing. And we're seeing kind of the fruits of that. Whilst we will give out about UFC, not ta signing talent, uh, you know, that talent is getting signed up to Bellator. They are getting signed up to PFL. And rather than what it used to be back in the day, Harry, where we used to get these promotions that used to be built up to a, a, a kind of a very good legitimate level and the UFC used to come in and snap them up 
and take all their talent. I think we're at a stage right now where, you know, all right, one organization might buy another organization, and maybe we'll talk about that in a minute, but it doesn't look like that's what the UFC's business model is anymore, is to kind of monopolize the industry and buy up all the competition. Um, do you kind of see it that way? And how do you kind of see the whole landscape kind of progressing as well? So I think in some way the competition is a double-edged sword. But for me, I would prefer to err on the side of optimism because the UFC used to be Real Madrid, right? And that would be, they would wait until a player was 25, 24, 26, anywhere in that, that 24, 26 age range. And then they'd buy them because price wasn't a bother and they would chuck them in and that would be it. The player is at the height of their powers. They're brilliant, wonderful players. And Madrid gets to reap all the benefits of that. Now, the UFC is more like a Arsenal, Manchester United, Liverpool, where they are still an absolutely gargantuan name. But they're not quite the same buying power. They don't have quite the same attraction because the, there's a Chelsea that does exist. And there is a Manchester United and there is an Arsenal and there is a Brighton and there is a, a, a West Ham and there is an Aston Villa, right? And so I think for me, there are, and I think it's an important, you've raised an important fourth topic about sort of the way that we look at MMA and that's the dark side of MMA. And that's a topic that we've long had on the list of Speakers Corner, but just don't quite know how to approach it. But I think it's important and we'll start that conversation here in a minute is like, if I'm a fighter, but let's not get away from it. You've just said it. The reason why you're still covering this sport is because of fights. We don't get fights without fighters. And so if you're a fighter, you want competition because without competition, there's no leverage. If I could, if I had a, if I was running a gym and I had a, a, a an amateur, undefeated amateur, 2-0 and in his pro record, and I wanted to sign him on to the next place, well, there was all these promotions that you've already listed. There's also Brave. There's also UAE Warriors. There's also Centurion. There's I also could, this place. Yeah, you could go on. You could go on. And I was like, every time I was naming the list, I was like, oh, I better mention this. There's someone will give out to me. But whatever. There's loads out there. And that's a good thing. Exactly. Because a fighter can then say, well, you know what? I can map my career how I want to my goals. Some fighters will say, I don't give a shit about the UFC. I don't want to get paid as much as possible for every single fight that I enter the cage for. Fine. No problem. And you will map your career in a very specific way to achieve that goal. There are some fighters that will say, I don't care if I never get paid a dime from MMA. I want UFC gold. That's all I want. Some fighters will say, I just want to hold a cage warriors title. It's something I've always looked up to. Alexander O'Sullivan, perfect example. In his performance after his cage warriors win, he said, look, I want to be the best fighter I can possibly be. Not money, not titles, not nothing. I just want to be the best fighter that I can be. I want to maximize my own potential. If that means my skills take me to a cage warriors title, and he said, I believe I can get that, fine. If I never make the UFC, but I'm the best fighter I could have been, I can hang my hat up with pride. Fine. So having options, and not only just options, but promotions that offer you a different schematic to the way your career will go is in of itself a good thing for fighters. Because you'll also have certain fighters that want to fight six times a year, five times a year. They want to be out all the time, super active. That's the way their brain works. That's the way their body works. That's the scheduling that works well for their life. Then you might get a fighter that wants three fights a year. You might get a fighter that wants two fights a year. And so having a promotion that can cater not just to the goals of the fighter's career itself, but also to the fighter's life, we forget that this is a job for these people, right? This is how they put food in their bellies and food on their family's table is this. So having promotions that offer a PFL tournament or a Ryzen and Bellator cross promotion or a KSW massive arena show, or a UFC that you could get six fights a year if you wanted, or a, 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 a Cage Warriors who set you on a clear path and you might get to travel around Europe with them. No problem. There are promotions out there that can offer a fighter a different flavor at all points. And I think this is something specifically in Irish amateur MMA. There's three or four different shows that put on shows semi-regularly now. 
And I think the thing that's great about them is a fighter, an amateur fighter could go and fight on all four in one year and have a completely different experience because every promoter will treat them slightly differently. The venues will be different. The way that the organizer runs the entire promotion will be different. The walkouts are different. The scheduling is different. Everything that they're going through is a different experience. And if MMA gives us one thing, it's experiences. It is. And on top of all of that, in the amateur game, you have IMAF as well, the chance to go over there to compete multiple times in, 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 in the course of a week against multiple different styles as well. So like for you uh, on the larger outlook of things, it, you know, obviously the UFC is number one. Uh, it has been for forever and it continued to be number one for quite some time, I believe. But we have now more than ever like UFC as a financial juggernaut, but not necessarily housing all the greatest fighters or the best fighters in each one's category or division. Um, and I think it's more common now than it ever has been before, where you can actually have legitimate conversations about a Bellator champion fighting a UFC champion and having that Bellator fight or win or PFL or one championship or whatever you want to call it. And vice versa, but you could have a, be a PFL champion that beats a Bellator champion, whatever. Do you think we're ever going to live in a world where we, you know, it's the, it's the kind of endless argument that we see on social media. Now we need to unify all of these fighters. We need to have, um, kind of unified divisions. Do you think we're ever going to live in a world of mixed martial arts where we see that? Absolutely not. Yeah, me either. Absolutely me either. not. I I think that unification for fighters makes sense from a bargaining perspective, but the idea of having a single promotion with unified or even cross-promotional fights that happen often, there's no way. There's just no way. Because one thing that MMA has always done pretty well, at least in its infancy, was stray away from the boxing model where it was, oh, well, he's not going to fight that guy because they have three different letters next to their name and politics and this and that and the next thing. The, one of the beautiful and amazing things that the UFC would do is they would say, oh, he's a fantastic fighter. When his contract's up, we're going to bring him over here. And then you could see this fight. We'll just, we'll just do it like. We'll just, yeah. fuck, we'll just do it. Now, do I think that there is uh, some merit and some excitement when it comes to cross-promotional shows like a Bellator versus Ryzen. I personally really, really enjoy those shows. One, from a philosophical standpoint, because it's like, well, we're not the UFC, Bellator aren't, and neither are Ryzen. We're not the UFC. We're not this financial juggernaut. But what we can do is we can meld together this fantastic roster of fighters that we have to put on a card of six to 12 fights that every single one of them are the elite level of MMA. It's a showcase, not just of MMA, but a showcase of how much willing there is between the two organizations to work together, to promote MMA, to further MMA as an individual art entity sport. And that's something I think that's slightly detracted away from what the UFC used to do with MMA and in a slightly different model, of course, they just buy the fighter and whatever, yeah. but with the cross promotional uh, performances and shows and whatever, we, we get to see, uh, unification and, and sort of humility between organizations. And so for that philosophical element alone, I really, really like them. You can argue that there is something there that these shows are doing it out of necessity right? Because they can't afford to keep the talent and they want to build relationships because they don't want to lose the talent over here. They don't want to lose. It. Fine. Maybe. As I said at the start of this, I prefer to lean on the side of optimism. And I say that Ryzen has a specific offering. Bellator has a specific offering. Both of them as organizations seem to work very well together. And the cards that they put on the fights they put together for those cards are always fantastic. And so I think both, and we've seen both can coexist but also exist in silo and be successful in doing so. I think you have to give plenty of credit to Scott Coker for doing that as well, because what that man has done, obviously he came up through kickboxing, but he built a very successful promotion in strike force back in the day that was eventually sold to the UFC. Then the UFC smartly gave him a job and he was under contract with them for quite some time, just doing some behind the scenes stuff um, for the UFC. 
broke free from his contract, went on with Bellator. And what he's been doing with Bellator over the last couple of years, Harry, has been very, very impressive as well. And I mean, you know, we Dana White, obviously the head honcho, the guy who gets all the plaudits and everything like that. But underneath, Scott Coker has been doing phenomenal work for the promotions that he's been attached to for himself, but also for the growth of mixed martial arts as well. Do you think that he gets enough credit? That's a very interesting question. Um, probably not. You know what he reminds me of slightly? This is this is a this is a comparison, right? So bear with me. He reminds me a little bit, and Graham's going to kill me. I apologize, Graham. He reminds me of Xabi Alonso in that in that Liverpool team because everyone spoke about Steven Gerrard, and yet the player that actually made that team tick that actually won games, that actually caused Liverpool to be as dominant as they were, was not Stephen Gerrard-like. It was Xavi Alonso. And so there's there's sort of this behind-the-scenes, underlying, solemn hum- humility, hum- humble beauty to Scott Coker, where, okay, he doesn't shy away from the limelight so much but he's not the brash enigmatic in your face person that dana white is now i think it's important that both exist right the ufc would not be where it is right now if it weren't for the influence of dana white 100 as we're discussing the breakdown of mma as a whole i think you're right that the net positive that scott coker has brought to the culture of MMA to the furthering of MMA as an entire entity certainly is not spoken about enough. I think how good Scott Coker does his job is based off of he's how long he's been in the industry and you haven't heard too much bad shit about him. You hear fighters speaking well about him and you don't hear Dana White talking shit on him too much either. When you know Dana White has that like secret level of respect where you know if he doesn't like someone, he's going to belittle him. He's done it with Oscar De La Hoya. He's done it with PFL. You know, he'll say Bellator makes questionable decisions, but you've never really seen him come out uh, through any stage and say or belittle what Scott Coker has done because I don't think he can be belittled. I think he... It's easy look at when you're ha- when you're kind of up and against Dana White, it's easy to look good as well. But generally speaking, you're not going to be in the industry for as long as he has been without kind of getting or shining your true colors and you know dana white is his true colors have uh, have shown out not a good color either um ever to be honest you know but i have to say with scott coker i've been massively impressed especially what he's done with strike force in the past and then now what he's doing again with bellator and kind of brings us to kind of one of the biggest stories happening outside of ufc and that's um bellator being up for sale right now and and what that may mean because no matter what happens with the with the sale of Bellator, if it gets sold, if it's not, Scott Coker needs to remain at the helm there, and he needs to have a big say because um, history has proven that he's absolutely very good at his job and building talent and building a promotion. He's not just done it once; he's doing done it twice, and is doing it and continuing to do it with Bellator. Their business structure has been based off signing these young prospects and building them up, and I think he did the same in strike force as well remember all the champions that have come over and, and were ufc champions that came from strike force obviously ronda being a very famous one as well along with luke rockhold along with tyron woodley uh you know amongst a bunch of other fighters as well that have come over but how do you feel about the potential sale of bellator and i guess the the favorites uh right now are pfl to kind of come in and and take over the reins and and acquire the roster to me my biggest question is will will or can pfl keep in the same structure if they do take over at bellator and they acquire that level of talent because fighters need to fight at the end of the day and the current pfl structure is not going to accommodate them picking up bellator's talent and only running events for a certain amount of time during the year yeah the answer is I, I don't know i really don't know i don't think we know enough about the details um obviously it would entirely depend as you say on pfl's offer on their infrastructure on their ability to scale their ability to scale at dramatic pace as well which we've seen 
in mixed martial arts that you often find at the helm of these organizations are interesting characters, right? MMA certainly breeds a specific type of person, a specific type of character that wants to get involved in the sport, especially at a, a sort of a CEO promotional type level. Um, and so I think that there are lots of questions, lots of tangible questions to be answered around who buys Bellator. What does that look like from a from a functional perspective, from a day to day perspective? What does it look like? What does it look like for the fighters that are currently signed to a contract of Bellator? And all of these things, let alone the logistics, as you've rightly mentioned about putting actual fights on and and getting fighters fighting, because it feels like really the only the only organization that has the ability to put that sort of a thing on is the UFC, right? Like it's only in you know, the UFC is, is, is desperate for more talent, desperate for more fighters, desperate for, for, uh, skill and stars and names and characters to pack out some of the shows that they have on their fantastically busy schedule. And so it feels like the person to buy Bellator would be the UFC in the same vein the UFC have passed this prologue, right? They have always seemingly bought out their competitors and Bellator by far is their biggest competitor. And so it's going to be interesting, mostly just for the landscape of MMA to see what happens with Bellator. Because if the UFC decide to not go with Bellator and not decide to, to, to purchase them or, or whatever, it sends a really interesting signal about who the UFC is right now what their priorities are right now and let equally that question let me ask that question because i was going to and you were kind of going down that road is that back then when ufc were acquiring promotions they did want to be known as the best promotion in mixed martial arts with the biggest and the best talent attached to that promotion as well but now it seems like they've steered more away from that think way of thinking and more towards how much money can we make as an organization. And that's obviously coming with the acquisition from Endeavor and, and Ari Emanuel, who's doing some, look at, you have to say from a business point of view, the UFC are absolutely killing it right now, <laughs> like breaking record numbers. Um, my overall or my overarching thought um, on that would be UFC as a promotion who are trying to help, and build and grow the sport of mixed martial arts for many, many years and did such an excellent job in doing that have seemed to kind of try and steer away from that a little bit more and focus on them as a money-making machine where you're getting maybe not the best quality of product that you would have been getting in the past or the best possible product that is available for us. Like, I mean, if they were going out and snatching out all of this, all of these talents, I mean, the reason why the PFLs and the Bellators and the one championships really are doing so well, I believe in a minor minuscule way is because they're not going out and acquiring their high level talent anymore. They're more so happy to, cut corners obviously not share enough revenue with their fighters that story came out from john nash recently as well and i guess you know my overall question is have ufc kind of gone from an organization looking to build a sport of mixed martial arts to one that's kind of you know slowly kind of diminishing it a little bit based off their business model okay there's a lot there um i'll start by saying I think that the UFC are in absolute no way uh, obligated to pay a fighter any more than they already do. They're not obligated to share any of the profits that they have or have not got with a fighter. Um, from an ethical and from a moral standpoint, you and I can sit here and agree uh, that the fighters deserve a larger share, For that sure. the fighters deserve to be paid what we determine to be more fairly. But the, the UFC has an agreement with each individual fighter about how much they are paid. It's written on a piece of paper that, the sign, that has been signed by the fighter and the promotion. And so there is absolutely nothing in any law playbook 
that will tell the UFC that they are forced in any way, shape or form to pay a fighter any more money than they already are or have done. Is that correct from a business standpoint? Absolutely. You couldn't, oh, yeah. be, you couldn't be more correct that Ari Emanuel and Dana White and Lorenzo and Frank Fatita have come in and they have made the UFC over the last 30 years the highest performing business in sports, uh, in, in combat sports, sorry, full stop. The, the, the point that John Nash was making was about all the profits for every MMA organization and every boxing organization put together is massively dwarfed by the UFC's profits. Massively dwarfed by the UFC's profits. And so you look at the monopoly in terms of financial dominance and the UFC is far, 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 far triumphant. But I think that what we can draw from that, what we can surmise from that is what you've already said is that the UFC used to be an organization that wanted to further a sport. The UFC, and I think this is where some of the distaste and some of the distrust comes from the UFC, is that we look at UFC 290 and it is an amazing showcase of mixed martial arts, an absolute smorgasbord of elite, ultra elite level MMA, the highest levels of MMA that you're going to see in 2023 is going to be on that UFC 290 card. However, I think some of the distrust and some of the distaste comes when UFC are in a position where they are so financially dominant and they are so financially available that you have even further room for growth, even further room where the promotion could be pushing mixed martial arts. And that doesn't necessarily mean, because this is a, a sort of a, 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 I can't think of the word when I go against myself. What's that? I'm contradicting myself. Um, yeah. Yeah. I contradict, Jesus, lad. Sorry, English. Jesus, so <laughs> I'm contradicting myself in a way, because if the UFC went and continued the old UFC model, which is just, look, lads, we're going to buy every single great fighter that we know of. None of the organ other organizations that we know and love would exist in the same way. That's Everything would be a feeder to, to the UFC. And we don't want that. As no. fans, we don't want that. The PFL has given us some fantastic moments. Some of the, the tournaments, everything, Bellator tournaments have been great. Some of the rise and crossovers, beautiful. We've loved them. But you don't get the same level of enjoyment if you don't have an elite level MMA provider uh, in terms of an athlete showing you those things. And so it's a double-edged sword, right? We want the UFC to still be the premier uh, organization. We want the UFC to pay their fighters far, far, far more than any other organization because they have the means to do so. But in the same vein, if the UFC did that, if the UFC said, right, lads, any fighter that signs for us starts on 75 and 75, any fighter. If you're fighting for a title, you're being paid a minimum of $2 million. And if you're a champion, you're paid no less than $5 million. Let's just, I'm just chucking fucking silly, yeah. whatever, right? Is the that sustainable that, though? That it, we don't know whether that's sustainable or not. One is it sustainable, but two, every other organization is dead overnight. Mm. Every single one. Because every, and I mean, they're not, but it means every single fighter goes from wanting to be Brendan Lochnan and wanting to say, okay, I'm going to go to the PFL and I'm going to win a million. And then I'm going to do it again. And then I might even do it again. It takes away from somebody saying, I'm going to be James Gallagher and I'm going to go and make the Jimmy show and Bellator a unification thing. Bellator is going to be the Jimmy show. I, I'm AJ McKee. I'm going to sign at zero and zero a clean record with Bellator and work my way up straight through Bellator all the way to a title. That doesn't exist because every fighter is then saying, get me a fight wherever and get me to the UFC. And so whilst we rightfully should be talking about the UFC's ability to grow the sport again, the ability to acquire these fighters, the ability to pay their fighters more justly, in our opinion. I also think there is room to have a conversation about what happens if they did, right? Because the other side of it is they again set the standard for every other organization. Yep. And 
I mean, it's a valid, valid point because maybe the UFC are like <laughs> kind of subconsciously just saying, hey, look, at we've done our part. Now it's up to you guys. <laughs> We're happy enough. We've built our name. We're going to stay making money. Um, but, you know, I think in general, the current landscape right now, all about, look, at fighters could be getting paid more no matter what organization they are. The UFC gets kind of tarnished with that brush because, and look, at rightfully so tarnished as well, let's be real. But that they're getting tarnished even more because they're earning more money. And we see these reports coming out and we see how much money they're making as well. But, uh, you know, sustainability is a big thing. And it's been the uh, the, the build up and the ruination of uh, prom promotions from the past as well. So it'll be interesting to see what happens down the line. Um, and, yeah, that, it was just a general look at uh, mixed martial arts today. I think we covered a, co a few topics, Harry, um, before we finish up. Uh, yeah, I was going to hand it over to you to say if you have any more final thoughts that you want to add in before we we shut her down for the week. I just wanted to to just go over one last topic, if that's possible. Yeah, and cool. that, it's just a it's just a thought I have on on sort of we, we talk about the Colby Covingtons and we talk about the the sort of the characters in MMA, if you will. And I sort of wanted to get your opinion on on what you think the landscape is right now because let me just set this question up just a tiny bit better um i realize i'm talking and not really saying anything um my thought on this is there was always characters right a fighter had a character they had a personality whatever you want to call it whether it was fabricated whether it was their genuine self there was always a level you talk about gsp a lot of that was just himself. Josh Koscheck, a lot of that was just himself. Tyron Woodley, a lot of that was himself. When Brock Lesnar came over, himself. Kane, DC, all these names. They build a character, they show themselves as characters throughout their careers. I feel like with the influx of importance and reliance on social media as a promotional tool for fighters as an individual brand, more than before fighters feel as though they have to stand out with more than just their fighting ability what do you think in 2023 the positives and the negatives of quote unquote building a character is for mma fighters the positives of building a good character for me Look, if you want to take an example of, and you mentioned Kofi Covington, like who, you know, when I, it's based off my opinion, I'm totally comfortable with people putting on a character because it's an entertainment business, business at the end of the day. Look at the recent kind of, if you want to call it an acquisition of WWE from Endeavor, um, I think, you know, has kind of put WWE and the UFC under the same umbrella. But if you look back, there's a lot of similarities between the two. And in the WWE or the WWF back in the day, you weren't going to be successful. It's the same thing, Harry. You could be the best wrestler in the whole of the fucking organization, but you don't have a good gimmick and you don't have a good character and you cannot portray that character. You're not going to be successful in the wrestling industry. Um, I feel... I think an example of a of maybe WWE used to get a lot of critics was John Cena, not the best wrestler, but a fantastic gimmick that sold. You know, um, more so in mixed martial arts, it matters how you do inside the octagon, and that's what matters most to me. What you say or what you do outside of that, to me especially, doesn't really matter fuck all, to be honest. Um I am interested in what you do when the cage doors close. I, I, I've been watching WWE. I've been watching mixed martial arts and boxing. And you have to sell yourself. And even more so, you have to sell yourself. The positives and the negatives. Uh, the positives are as if, that if we get a genuine guy like GSP, who just is his natural self and is also one of the greatest fighters of all time at the top of the sport, you know, it shines it in a good way. For a time, Conor McGregor had that mantle as well. But Conor McGregor also had his, had his dark side, which brought it down as well. Colby, Colby Covington recently, you know, great fighter, but has chosen a very dark path to sell himself and went down. But Colby Covington sells pay-per-views and Colby Covington had to sell his soul to put himself into a market that 
you know, it was that Republican market in the US. That's what Colby Covington is trying to target. And that's exactly what he did. And you know what? People hated, but a lot of people love that shit as well. Um, Israel Adesanya is probably the best kind of representative of mixed martial arts. Yeah, he's a little bit cringy and yeah, he's a little bit corny, but better be cringy and corny than than rude and racist. That's the way I look at it. Um, I think with the introduction of social media, like fighters have had to kind of, you know, put on that character a little bit more. And I can understand why people will buy into it and I can understand why people won't buy into it. Me personally, I understand that it's a part of the business and it's a part of the industry in mixed martial arts. It was, it was the same in boxing. It's the same in WWE or in sports entertainment industry here. And you've got to sell yourself. Um, I mean, if you're going to be, it's a dog eat dog world. And if you're going to be laying down and not trying to be your true self or, or not making at least a little bit of an effort, I think you're going to fall flat in modern day mixed martial arts. Um, you know, I'm not a big person. I don't put like, too much personal stuff on social media it's all mma stuff and it takes energy it takes this it takes that and then you're kind of brought into the trap of you know reading comments and seeing what other people are saying about you as well which can have an adverse effect on some people that can be a negative as well um but a positive thing is that it can raise your popularity and when your popularity gets raised and if you have the skill set to match it that means you're going to be presented with better opportunities which means you're going to be presented with more financial opportunities and better pay etc etc so that's where you have your double-edged sword it's kind of out of the frying pan into the fire when it comes to building personalities there but to me i must understand i don't buy into a lot of the shit i hear i don't want to take it personally i don't hate on it i don't love it you know some people capture the, imagin uh, the imagination sometimes but for me it ain't worth jack shit unless you go in there and you actually perform to a high level inside the octagon or into the cage or wherever you're fighting, to be honest. And I think that to me, this to me is, is where the sport starts to get a little bit gray, a little bit sad is that there is an element, I think where now in modern mixed martial arts, it is imperative for a fighter to have a character that resonates with fans that can be, resonating positively well that can be resonating negatively so many times do i see fans talk about an instagram post or a tweet or a this or a that one fighter i think that i've seen and has been we've seen him praised for it and i, I it just sits half uncomfortably with me is arnold allen recently yeah for the longest time, Arnold Allen, he was running an eight to 10 fight win streak in one of the most difficult divisions in the UFC and yet can't get a big fight until he starts posting pictures of his dog's balls and sending them to, you know, UK prime ministers and this and that and the next thing. And it's like that to me is a really sad element of mixed martial arts is that we can't in this era of 2023, nothing to do with MMA, nothing to do with, with anything MMA related, but just as a, as a society, we want fighters to entertain us with more. There is such a greed in us that we are desperate for fighters to entertain us and to be more than elite level combat athletes. We forget I think in a lot of ways that these endeavors that we watch on a weekend are an entire life's embodiment of work and we take it for granted. And I think that promotions capitalize on that. And I think promotions, and this is where I lay, lay blame to some of the promotions is promotions look for viral moments. What do you think embedded series is? It's just waiting for viral moments, the tough house, viral moments all you'll see on ig clips or twitter clips is knockouts is this is that it's the next thing it's all viral moments and so one thing i would like if anyone has managed to get this far fair play to you but if one thing is to be taken away from this specific podcast the breakdown of mma in 2023 is that we should remember that this thing is about the fighters and one thing we should absolutely do with a real imperative is 
remain fully cognizantly aware that fighting is an all encompassing sport and we should be so hyper aware of that. Absolutely. Very well said. And I think it's the perfect way to round up the balance breakdown this week. Like I said, no fights. We wanted to bring you something. We didn't really know what we were going to talk about or what roads we went down. We went down a couple of avenues there, but I thought it was a, a very good and an interesting conversation. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this week. Thank you to the great Harry Powell. Follow him at BJJ underscore Harry Powell and myself at I O'Neill MMA. Sign up to the Severe MMA Patreon. You'll hear more conversations similar enough to this on Speaker's Corner over on the Patreon, fantastic podcast amongst another couple, the Jason Pack out this week as well. The Al Triangle is not out this week, but the week after, so you can check it out there. Sometimes I don't remember. But thank you all for tuning in. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and we shall talk to you very, very soon. We'll be back with the preview show on Wednesday. Amir Al-Bazi versus Kai Kara France is the headliner there. We talk a lot about the flyweight division as a whole. Uh, please do. Not a great card, but a good podcast. I can promise you that on the preview for that fight night coming up this weekend. Thank you all. Appreciate the support. We'll talk to you again soon. Take care.